Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? 11 o'clock. How are we doing? It's so great to be with you. My name is John. Thanks for being here at Life Church, where faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. So, on your seats, there are connection cards to fill out, but there's also pictures of the Home Alone kid. If you pull out that card, that is an invite card. You can put that up at the break room, put that up at Starbucks. You could slap a stamp and an address label on it, mail it to somebody you know, because this is it. This is the week before Christmas, and we want to let people know about this new church you've discovered and they can come sit with you next Sunday, which is Christmas Eve. Can you believe it? We're at wow. the big time now, right? This is it. Crunch time. Christmas Eve is next Sunday. We will still have our morning worship experiences at 9.30 and 11, where we will be celebrating baptisms. Yay. More on that in just a moment. Then you're invited to come back at 3 p.m. on Christmas Eve where we have a completely different family-friendly Christmas Eve worship experience for you and the kiddos. It's under 60 minutes, so we'll get you in, we'll get you out in time to celebrate your uh, traditions on Christmas Eve. Bring your family, bring your friends, tell your neighbors, literally tell your neighbors, oh. they're looking for a church to visit in Christmas why not make it Life Church? So use those invite cards, bring them next Sunday. We will be celebrating baptisms, which is an outward symbol of an inward faith. And if you've never been baptized as a follower of Christ, what better Sunday than on the Sunday where we celebrate Jesus' birthday? Your baptism could be the best birthday present for Jesus this holiday season, you can register for baptisms on our website, lifechurchmichigan.com backslash baptisms. Go on ahead and register for 9.30 or 11. Tell all your family and friends to come and take obnoxious photographs. It'll be great. We're excited for baptisms next Sunday. And then we have New Year's Eve. We will have church on New Year's Eve. Heading into January, we have a brand new message series called Experiencing Jesus. We're going to do something we've never done before. Every New Year's, you have resolutions. I'm going to lose weight. Yeah, right. I'm going to go deeper with God. We want to help you. We want to get a tool into your hand for our January message series on experiencing Jesus. As a church community, we're going to be reading through a book together called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. It's not a downer. I read the first chapter last night. It's actually going to fill you up. If you've always said, I want to go deeper in my faith, I want to learn more, this is your opportunity. We have one free copy of the book per household. Additional copies are $10 a piece. On your way out, make sure you grab your household's copy of Gentle and Lowly. We'll read a chapter a day starting January 1st goes for 23 days. The Sunday messages will tie right in with what we're reading. You're going to love it. Make sure you get your copy and your free bookmark today in the front lobby. And last but not least, pull out your smartphones. Let's check in on Facebook. Go on ahead and check in to Life Church Saginaw. You can use the hashtag, um, we are that church. Use that hashtag. That's a great one. Uh, that way you're letting your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers know all about this church you discovered. Go on ahead and check in on Facebook. So, now that all that's out of the way, we have been talking about the Chris mess that always seems to happen in our lives every holiday season. We approach Christmas with a little bit of excitement, we trim the tree, we go shopping, everybody's drinking eggnog and having a good time, but then, inevitably, stuff happens. Life gets in the way, and we begin to wrestle with anxiety, with depression, with stress. It becomes a crisp mess, and we want to pick up every piece. We want to kill the things that are killing us this Christmas season. And if I had to sum up today's message in a single hashtag, it would be this. 
joy killers. Every Christmas, we start to get excited, and then life happens, and it becomes a joy killer. We want to rediscover joy this week heading towards Christmas. We want to fight for joy in our lives. You have permission to get excited this Christmas season. Because beyond all the television specials, beyond all the bows and wrapping and presents and shopping lists, this is about God coming down to earth in a body to be with us. That should fill us with joy. At the very first Christmas, God sent out a birth announcement, not to kings and queens, not to presidents and important people, but to a bunch of shepherds. If you've got a Bible or a Bible app, Turn to Luke chapter 2, where we read about the very first Christmas in Bethlehem. It says in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. Now Bethlehem is kind of like a suburb outside of the big metropolis of Jerusalem. Shepherds were at the low end of the social totem pole. On Facebook, they had no friends, they had no followers. They lived a lonely existence outside the city, away from the hustle and bustle. They earned a meager minimum wage, blue collar living by taking care of little lambs, growing them up into sheep, and then they would bring them to the temple where these animals that they attached their hearts to would be slaughtered for temple rituals. Because the shepherds were dirty, they didn't shower, they didn't have aftershave, so they had beards longer than ZZ Top. They were hanging out with unclean animals with hooves. The shepherds that were providing sheep for the temple, ironically, could not walk into the temple. They were outsiders, unclean, stay away. And yet, the very first birth announcement for Jesus Christ came to the shepherds. So that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep from wolves and from predators. But then something happens that they had no idea was coming. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. These shepherds who had never been to the temple, who were not allowed to go to church, who had very little information and education about God, were now thrust into a supernatural experience. And if they had money, if they were able to buy an iPhone, you better believe they were out there taking photos. Because they're like, what is this, right? This is crazy. It says in the text, they were terrified. They were freaking out. Jebediah, do you see that? Yes, I do, Joash. Oh, my. But the angel reassured the shepherds. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy. There's that word. Joy for all people, not just the people in Bethlehem, not just the people in Israel, This is going worldwide, just like Pitbull said. All right? The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem. In ancient Hebrew, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. 33 years later, Jesus grows up, and in the book of John, he declares himself to be the bread of life, born in the house of bread. It says that this is happening in the city of David. So there is royalty that runs through the bloodstream of this young Christ child. You will recognize him by this sign. Not by legions of guards. Not by gold coins and riches surrounding this king. No, you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. Lying in a manger. 
the almighty, all-powerful God who looks at the universe as if it were a piece of lint, condescended himself, put on the likeness of humanity, and entered our messiness, literally in an animal feeding trough. I've got two dogs. I've got a wiener dog who piddles everywhere. And I, I have a larger uh, dog that jumps up on you, goes crazy. Animals are unpredictable. They are messy. My dogs are always chewing things up, ripping things apart. And yet it's in that messiness in a cave surrounded by barnyard animals with the stench of farm animals, muck, mud everywhere. That's where Jesus was born. A complete humility, poverty. And that should bring us joy. That in Christ there's a second chance. That in Christ God is not afraid of the mess you've made with your life. There's always a second chapter to be written. There's always more to your story because of Christ. That should get us excited. Jesus taught that we are to have a faith like little children. So we had some of the life kids up here kind of singing. <laughs> My favorite was a little girl that was on the offbeat. Was saying, Mom, Mom, on the offbeat. It was great. It was like a, a hip-hop rap song, right? <laughs> if that was your child, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really I get I got five kids. What was I trying to say? <laughs> Jesus became a child. He entered our messiness. He said, have the faith of a child. Children at Christmas time, they get excited, right? They get the butterflies in the tummy, and they can't wait for Christmas morning. That's the type of faith that you have permission to lean into this holiday season. But it's a choice you have to make. You don't just discover joy. Joy doesn't just interrupt your life. You have to choose to be a person oozing with joy. The problem in the holidays is there's joy killers. There's three joy killers that I think affect us all at this time of year. The first joy killer is busyness. We are so busy this time of year. I, I don't know about you, but this is the last week of, of the year before Christmas, and my schedule is packed. I look at my work schedule, I have to do extra hours to deal with more people. I look at my children's schedule, I have a Christmas program on Tuesday at 10, and then again on Wednesday at 10, different schools. I gotta figure out how to get off work to attend and then take pictures, and so I gotta get there early because there's always those people that show up and take all the best seats in the front, and then you're stuck in the back, and you gotta bald ahead forever in your video, right? And then I gotta figure out my Christmas shopping, My shopping list is longer than Santa's naughty and nice list, so I gotta go shopping, and then I gotta figure out how to wrap these darn presents, because I'm a dude, and the guys don't wrap presents very well. I'm gonna put it in a paper bag and say, there you go, America. Right? So I'm pretty busy. I got stuff to do. So I'm glad I was able to schedule in some church, right? But all that busyness, it just like squeezes out the joy. Because people are standing in line in front of you at the checkout, and, and you're like, there's got to be another checkout person here. And you keep your foot in line, but you're kind of looking, why don't they hire more people here? Come on, Macy's, right? Or you're trying to drive to your destination. Oh, my Lord. I was at the corner of Titipawasi and Bay Road yesterday at 3 p.m., Bad idea. <laughs> traffic jam up the wazoo. People cut me off in traffic. I saw the finger. I saw bird clips. <laughs> Wasn't a little birdie, okay? And I'm like, come on, you could let me in. Just let me in right here. But no, you don't know Jesus, so you're not going to let me in, right? <laughs> we get so darn busy and so worked up and our blood pressure is going up and down that, that we just lose any semblance of joy. And yet, the Apostle Paul, 2,000 years ago, while he was chained in house arrest, he's chained to a, a Roman soldier, 
These are giant, muscular, hairy, smelly centurions. He's under house arrest in Philippians. And, and he says all these things about joy. Philippians 4.4, 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. Again, I say, have joy. He's in the worst conditions. No showers, no Wi-Fi, no internet streaming, no Netflix. Next to, you know, grouchy job of the hut here. And he's not throwing a pity party. He's not depressed. He's not down. He's got an inner joy that he chooses because he realizes who he is in Christ or whose he is in Christ. And because of the difference that God has made in his life, his faith is an explosion of love and joy. You have permission to be joy-filled this holiday season. Later in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 18, this same Paul says, Be joyful, be filled with joy in some circumstances. No! All circumstances. Whether life is great, life is sour, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether things are going swell or things are not so well, be joyful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. So often we get hung up trying to decipher, trying to discern what is God's will for me? Joy! It's to stop taking yourself so seriously. Be filled with that childlike wonder and delight in Christ. This is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. The second joy killer that many of us wrestle with is consistency in our faith. This is the time of year when we have so much on the schedule that we, you know, I don't have to miss out on church on this Sunday, or I guess I just don't have time to read my Bible here, or I just don't feel like praying. I'm so tired and exhausted. And our consistency in Christ drops. When we are inconsistent in our faith, joy leaks out. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians is a great book. It's all about fighting for joy. Paul says, above all, on top of everything, the number one thing you need to know, live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So live for what is eternal. If you can see it, it's temporary. If it's unseen, then it matters. Remember who you are in Christ. Live as if you are the son or daughter of the Most High. That the King delights in you. One of my favorite quotes from the late Dr. Tim Keller is, Who would dare interrupt a king's sleep at 2 a.m.? for paltry askings. That's the type of access that we have when we pray. You matter to God. Your life matters. And if you are a follower of the Carpenter King, you have been transformed for all eternity. And so live consistently, walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling you have. Make scripture a priority, make prayer a growth area, make church a super priority on your schedule and see what God can do through you. The third joy killer, and I'm guilty of this, is comparison. We compare ourselves to others. Comparison robs us of contentment and joy. It used to be when Instagram first came out years ago, you would scroll through and 
It was a great way to share photos with loved ones and with the world. You wouldn't even see an advertisement until, you know, after 20 posts. Now, a days, with the algorithms trying to get more advertising dollars, you just scroll one or two photos, and then, wow, there's an advertisement that makes you feel less than. Like, if I don't get this product, or if I don't take this vacation, or if I don't look like this person, something's wrong with me, and we start to compare ourselves to everybody else, and then we buy things we can't afford with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. The comparison game robs us of joy. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Paul says, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men tell you how important they are. They are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. When we get wrapped up, in worldly desires and in coveting what is ours. It squeezes out the joy. Instead of Christmas being about what we can give, we make it about what we can get. And when you become Scrooge, your world gets smaller and smaller. But when you become joy-filled, your world gets larger and larger. We've looked at three joy killers. Let's flip the script and look at three joy generators. Three things that we can embrace this week as we head toward Christmas and see what God can do in our lives. The first way to flip the script is to remember that Jesus came and he was generous. Because Jesus was generous, we can be generous. What I've discovered in my own life is that when I hold back, when I shrink back with my time, talents, and treasures, I'm like Scrooge. And I, I become very protective of my little idols, my precious, my precious, like Lord of the Rings. But when I open up my life to others, when I become more generous, it makes me lighter. It gives me warm feelings. It generates joy. You and I have permission to be generous with our time. We all have time. Talents, you're all wired in remarkable ways. And our treasures, even our checkbook, can bring us joy when we direct our funds in God-honoring ways. Generosity can flip the script on joy killers. God is generous. God is always giving us things. He gives us life. He showers us with love. Christmas reminds us how valuable we are. That he entered into our world to be with us. 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. What is the gift? It's Jesus. And his message of forgiveness, wholeness, shalom, that generates joy. And we look at the generosity of God the Father through God the Son by the power of God the Spirit. The most famous Bible verse of all, John 3.16, it says, For God loved the world in this way. This is how God showered us and showed us his love. He gave. God is generous. He's open-handed. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in Christ will not perish, but will have eternal, ongoing life uninterrupted. God didn't have to do this. He chose to do this out of love. And his compassion, his generosity should fill us with joy and excitement. You have permission to be excited about church. We gather on the day that Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. And so then we get to walk in his footsteps. And with our very lives, we get to be generous with others. And when you're generous, there's no other feeling like it. I'll tell you what. You feel so much joy 
So much excitement when you can put a smile on someone else's face. 2 Corinthians 9-7 says, You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly. You know, later we're going to talk about our Christmas offering, how we're giving above and beyond our normal offerings so that we can fund our kids and teens programs in 2024. But when it comes time to talk about the Christmas offering, don't get all scroogey. Don't like, you know, here's a piece of land. Don't give reluctantly or, or even in response to pressure. Like, don't feel any pressure. Every week, I say this and I mean it. If you're new today, please keep your wallet in your pocket. Our church is not after your money. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully of their time, their talents, the treasures. That's a way to flip the script and experience more joy is to be generous in this final week before Christmas. A second way to flip the script is through community. We need each other. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. Even Jesus had a posse, a couple buddies that he had with him throughout life. He entered into the world alone, but when he grew up, he recruited 12 band of brother type disciples. And he didn't pick the cream of the crop. He picked all the redneck knuckleheads. He put a <laughs> religious zealot who wanted to overthrow the government right alongside a tax collector who was funding the government. That's the type of sense of humor Jesus had. He put two brothers who fought against each other all the time, so much that they were called the sons of thunder. And he said, you're going to be buddies. You're going to go out and change the world. That's how Jesus rolls, because he realized that we're made for relationships. The enemy would love to isolate you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy your faith. And so he wants you to believe the lies of COVID that you have to stay in your apartment, stay in your home, be alone this Christmas. But Jesus invites you into a larger world, a world of community, of doing life together. Everybody can lean on each other. I think there's three types of community in church world. The first is the Sunday morning experience where we all come together and we worship and we sit under the teaching of the word. There's something about a Sunday rhythm that brings joy to our hearts, about being together. That's why you like to go to concerts. Concerts are worship services. You're ascribing worth to a band that you like. That's why Sundays at church fill you up. You're ascribing worth to your creator. That's who you were created to worship. We also experience community in a secondary way, through life groups that meet in people's homes during the week. Doing life together. A couple of other men and women who are just as imperfect as you are, who are not into the comparison trap, but are there to cheer for each other, to pray for one another. When, when life hands you lemons, they bring you lemonade. And, and you can find a life group on our website. There's a new one starting this January. We also find community in, in smaller, smaller tribes of, of really close friends, usually two or three close friends. Even Jesus, he had his group of 12, but then he had his three, Jim, Pete, John, that he always was doing life with. Maybe that's someone that you text it and check in on. Maybe it's someone that you, you hang out with once a week or talk to once a month. Community is important. Community is there to lift you up when life tries to bring you down. God created you for relationship. So this past week, um, our family journeyed to Ohio for my mother's funeral. And we had to stand at the, the front, you know, and receive people. You know, people come to offer their, pay their respects, offer their condolences, shake their hand. And, you know, when it's your mom, it's a lot of senior citizens, seasoned citizens, I should say. And they're coming along, and you don't know who they are. You're just shaking their hand and saying, thank you for being here. And then I, I, I see this line, and in the line, I see th these eyes, and I see a face. And it's a face that I kind of semi-recognize, but I, I'm not quite sure, and I kind of did a double take. And this man walks forward, and, and 
it was my old high school buddy, who I haven't seen in 25 years. He was the best man in our wedding, and then life kind of got in the way, and we lost track with each other, and he lives in Iowa, and his job, he flies all over the place, he's a lobbyist, or clean energy, I haven't talked to him in 25 years. And here's a picture of us at my mom's funeral. That meant the world to me. I went and gave him this big bear hug, and listen, men cry. I was sobbing in his shoulder. I couldn't believe that he took the time to get an airline ticket, fly from Iowa to Ohio. I couldn't believe he came to Ohio, because those people, oh my goodness, Ohio? <laughs> they've got problems. The Ohio State, like, get over yourself, right? <laughs> He came to be with us and to pay his respects and to be a support. That's community. That's community in action. There may be somebody you haven't talked to in years, your old college friends, somebody from your last job that you clicked with but just had lost track of each other. This could be the week that you reestablish community with them. This could be the week that you go on our website and register for a life group and give it a shot and see what God can do through you. You can flip that script of community. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, uh, the author of Hebrews says, let us not neglect meeting together. You can't do life alone, as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now, as the day of his return is drawing near. We need each other. It starts with this church, then it grows into finding a group, and then if you're really lucky, find those close friends that you can do life together with. That brings joy. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you and me. One other way to flip the script is simply to do this. Let's put this up on the screen. Serving humbly. We can have joy because Jesus came to serve humbly. In Luke 19, he says that I came to serve, not to be served. Christmas reminds us that God is a humble God. He's infinite, glorious, magnificent, the most beautiful person you will ever see, and yet he became a fragile baby. The infinite became an infant, as Charles Spurgeon said. The book of Philippians chapter 2 shares an ancient hymn that records this mystery. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to or to lord over us or to hang over our heads. No. Instead, Jesus gave up his divine privileges. He temporarily veiled his divine attributes. He, it literally means in the Greek, he emptied himself of his divine attributes. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. It's God in a body. When he appeared in human form, Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus didn't enter the world with swagger. He didn't enter the world with 10,000 Instagram followers. In fact, you could argue he only had 12 followers. Son of God. Humility. Always serving others. Think about the Last Supper. If I knew that tonight was my last night on earth and that the next day I would die, I wouldn't throw a meal for 12 people who were going to turn their backs on me. I wouldn't wash the feet of Judas. And yet Jesus did. He humbly served others. He lived the perfect life that we cannot live, and then he died in our place. He didn't have to die on a cross. How humiliating to be scoffed, mocked, his beard ripped, heaving, blood everywhere. The pain, the excruciating pain, excruciating meaning of the cross. Yet that's what Jesus came at Christmas to do, to die for our sins. He served us to the very end. His favorite title while on earth was not son of God, but son of man. 
which means servant of humanity. He's from the house of bread, not from the palace or the Hilton of honor. Everything about Jesus whispered humility, serving others. When there's times that I feel down or depressed, <laughs> what I find brings me joy is to serve others. I'll text someone an encouragement. I'll pick up the phone and talk to someone and try to brighten their day. I'll show up when no one's here and I'll vacuum. Not because I'm super awesome, but because it brings me joy to serve God and to serve others. The quickest way to get out of a rut is to get the spotlight off yourself and onto someone else. It produces joy. You become a joy generator and then it spreads to others. And your household can be inspired by your joy. And as you lean into scripture and spend time in prayer and reflect on the first Christmas, God will pour out more joy, more a life that you can experience what Jesus promised in John 10.10, 10, life abundant. <laughs> Let me pray for you all. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you and to explore your word together. Thank you for all the ways that you blessed us this past year, Lord, in our lives, the way you touched families, the way you've raised up new friends. Thank you for this church, Lord, where we can come and have permission to be excited about our faith. We can grow and humble forward in our faith together without fear of being judged knowing that no one's got it all figured out. But we worship you, the perfect one. Lord, as we turn our hearts and our affections towards this final song of worship and the giving of our tithes and offerings, we pray that this Christmas offering would be used to impact the lives of children and teenagers in the new year here at Life Church. That we can reach young lives, young minds, with the message of the gospel that transforms, that brings joy, that brings life. So, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon this Christmas offering. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you're preparing to give towards the Christmas offering this year, I want to share with you a video I filmed about two years ago with my youngest son and youngest daughter. Watch this. <laughs> There, see, that's the camera. Say hi. Hi. Hey, everybody. This is my four-year-old, Levi. Levi, can you tell everybody hi? Um, hi. There, we had to get our hand out of our pocket, huh? Levi, what, what's coming up? Is it going to be Christmas? Yeah. What happened at Christmas? It was snowing. It was snowing, that's right. Yeah. And what did God do at Christmas? He died on the cross. He died on the cross at Christmas? my three-year-old little Alicia, the punky princess. You wanna say hi? Hi. Tell everybody what's, what is coming soon. No. Snow? Um, Christmas. Christmas, that's right. Yeah. And what happens at Christmas? It's snowing. It's snowing, and what else? Um, God died on a cross. God died on a cross. Well, that's Easter, honey. That's Easter. This is Christmas. Do you know who came at Christmas? Santa, and who else came at Christmas? Um, Jesus. Jesus, baby Jesus was born. Did God give us his son? Yeah. Yeah. Who's on your shirt? Elsa. That's Elsa? What does Elsa sing? Let it go. Let it go. Yes. Then, then Elsa sings in, uh, in his castle. That's right. And I think first time forever. Anna sings first time in forever, and Elsa's in her castle. And now is the time 
in the worship experience where we get to share our gifts with God. We get to give of our tithes and offerings. Yay! Yay! That's right. So if you're brand new here, please leave your wallet in your pocket. We're not after your money. We're after your connection card, so you can drop off your blue connection card in the front lobby on the way out to receive a free gift. A swag bag! Yeah! Yay! And everybody else, you want to share your gift with Life Church, so go to lifechurchgive.com. Everybody else, we can share our gift at lifechurchgive.com or on the Venmo app. You just tap on Venmo and go to Life Church Michigan. And you can share your tax deductible year end gift with Life Church. Or you can give in the basket if you're here on site. Yes. Can you say Life Church? Life Church! Yay! Yeah, you can play video games if you want. That's fine. Can I do video games? You want to do video games? Okay, can you say bye bye, everybody? What's the video games? They're, they're over there, but can you say thank you?